Who deserves credit for being the godfather of three-point shooting in the NBA? What was it like to have Greg Popovich for a coach? How has the game completely changed since the 90s? The only question left is, say it with me, you win. Hey sports fans, Coach Nick here and welcome to the B-Ball Breakdown Podcast. Today I am very excited to bring on former NBA player and former NBA assistant coach Mario Ellie. Uh, Coach, thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to chop it up with you. Awesome. Well, you know, let's go back to, um, you know, the time when you were playing with the Rockets. I think that's an interesting time for me. Um, You know, there was a big jump in three-point attempts uh, right around the time you got there. And I was wondering, it it had to be a conscious thing across the whole team. Like, we are going to space and we are going Mm -hmm. to shoot more threes. Is that Was that, like, spoken out loud? It wasn't really. It was just part of our offense. Uh, Back then, when you had a dominant big man who drew a lot of attention, sort of like Elijah Wan and Shaq and Ewing, they draw double teams. So when double teams come, that means when you space the floor on the perimeter, somebody's going to get a wide open shot. You don't want to give a layup up, so you're not leaving Otis Thorpe underneath the basket. So that leaves maybe myself, Sam, Vernon, Robert, all of us out on the perimeter. So when the ball kicks out, that means the defense got to rotate. So one of us is going to be open. So the key is whoever's open, just be ready to shoot and knock it down. So that's how it really evolved. And also, Rudy T doesn't get enough credit in 95 for for putting Robert at the four position, which really allowed it to be four out and one in. So that's what you're seeing a lot now in the open pick and rolls when the big man rolls down. You got four of the guys spaced out, ready to shoot. I, I totally hear you. And I remember my memory of it, too, because, you know, I grew up in Chicago and it was not always easy to see the Western Conference stuff until the playoffs. Um, I remember the spacing. There wasn't a, a ton of movement on the perimeter by you guys, right? You would just space and and, and get to your spot in the line and sort of, you know, wait for the double. Would that, was yes. that a fair assessment? Perfectly said. That's, and that's how it was. We all had our spots. We know where the double team was coming. So as soon as the ball kicked out, that guy out of the double team or the guy in the perimeter had to rotate. Them guys had to rotate somewhere. So it was always going to be a time when one of us was going to be open. You just had to be ready to shoot or ready to make a play. Interestingly, um, you know, everybody else or a lot of people, especially up until that time, wouldn't have necessarily spaced to the three-point line. I feel like the first pass to the wing would have been like at the three-point line, but it was never going to be a shot, usually that first pass. So, you know... That that's an interesting evolution. I guess it's, it's just sort of a natural thing where all of a sudden, next thing you know, like, you know what, I'm going to have a little bit more room if I get behind there. Or, or, I mean, was Rudy T actually advocating, get behind that line and we need to get 23 point shots up a game? Well, the thing was, we had, like I told you before, we had a dominant force down low. If you wasn't going to double team Elijah on, it was 40, 45 points okay. easily. He was impossible to guard one on one. So we knew that going into a game. A lot of teams in their game plan was we have to double Elijah one. We can't let him get going. So it was up to the perimeter players to be ready to shoot. So especially when we played the Seattle Supersonics, when the ball was in the air, they went and double. They didn't even wait for Dream to catch the ball. They went to double Dream in flight. So we really had to be ready on the perimeter because they had big guards, very athletic. So when they would double and they were able to double and close out to our players. So. That was one of the tougher teams because they were long and very physical. But, you know, you just have to be ready to shoot. That's why the threes went up. When you have dominant big men, the threes are going to go up because they're going to get double teamed. Sure. Now, that Sonics team was pre-Payton and pre-Kemp. We're talking... Oh. Nate McMillan, Shrimp, all those guys. Yeah, yeah, those are tough teams. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about your the, the fundamentals and the of uh, and mechanics of your shot because it's a little bit um, unorthodox, I would say. It might be the word, although a lot of players shoot that way. So let me just ask you this. Did you all, so to describe your shot, and you can also fill it in, please, would be my memory of it was it was almost to the side of your head and kind of like a shot put. But when I went back last night and watched a little bit more of the footage of your shooting, it actually was, it was kind of more in front. It was a little bit low, like sort of in front of your face and then up. Um, when, did, How did that develop? Did you shoot that way from the outside your entire life? Or was that later on when you developed that style? 
it was later on because I was sort of growing up as a ball player, high school, college. I was sort of athletic, getting to the basket. Um, but I felt once I got drafted Milwaukee in 85 and got cut, I felt I had to work on my jump shots. So went overseas. You know, everybody sort of knows my story. Went all over the place, playing all these leagues. But when I got to the CBA, I really felt I was ready to get to the NBA. So I got called up by Golden State. So I'm passing all the history. And I felt I needed a shooting coach. And I, I got picked up by Golden State my first year. And after that first year, I went and got a shooting coach who really helped me. And um, had me sitting on the chair. Uh, I always had a slow release. But I just wanted, you know, I wanted the form and footwork to be right. So... You're right. I sort of brought it to the side. It was sort of a set shot. Yeah. It was sort of a, a set shot. And all Elijah one and all the guys used to get on me because I used to have a slow release. But long as I had time, I always felt like eight out of ten I was going to make it because I really worked on that shot religiously. You know, I wasn't really a good shooter as a young player, but I felt if I could shoot at least good enough, that would make me have a pretty good NBA career, and it worked out pretty well. For sure. Now, having a shooting coach, uh, that would have been, what, in 1994? I, I say 91. 91. Now, that had to have been a bit of, was that rare for people to do that? Not at all. A lot of guys to this day always had all shooting coaches, even guys who are good shooters. Uh, I got a good friend of mine in California who worked with a lot of pro players. And still to this day, he gets calls for guys, for, for him to fly in and to work with guys on their shooting. So, it's good that guys always want to get better, always want to tighten up their mechanics on their shot. For sure. You know, it's funny because, you know, we study shooting a lot these days and see what, what works and what doesn't, especially from distance using, you know, Steph and Clay as a model. And the thing with, you know, the two motion shot is basically what you shot. You know, the, it came to a, a pause and it's sort of a set and then you let it go. But it's hard to do that when you're releasing it above your head, which is, I think, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit younger than you, but not much. And I know that we were all instructed if you wanted to be a shooter, that ball needed to be a set at your eyebrow or higher, maybe even over your head. I think in the 60s and 70s, they really were doing that. And it seems to me that I think what the solution that you came up with, because by being it lower, allowed you to be a little bit more consistent. Because to me, if you're going to try and do a set point and like a two motion shot like you over your head, like Kobe would do, I don't think that you could ever really be consistent from distance. And I'm wondering, is is that how like that evolved where you're like, okay, if it's a little bit lower here, I can control it better and I can make that shot more consistently. Yeah, and uh, the difference with all the guys, they get volumes of shots. Me being a role player, have no problem saying I'm a role player. All my shots were sort of big shots. So I always really, really would focus when I would get the ball because I was a guy who would go into a game to get eight, eight to ten shots a game. Elijah Juan always know when he goes into a game, he's getting 25 shots. Jordan, all those guys. So guys like myself, I always focused very hard on every shot because I never know when the next three was going to come for me. I would have a lot of opportunities one night, then the next night I get three or four shots, which was fine. But I always had to be ready to shoot. So I was always conscious of that. When I got the ball, I got to make it count. You know, some of the guys listening to this and the gals who are listening to this uh, this podcast might not remember you, you know, live on the court. So I was wondering, can you give me a, a comp for the kind of player who, who plays like you now? Well, everybody, now that he changed his number to my number, everybody's saying P.J. Tucker. Oh, the yeah. 2018 Mario Ellie. He changed his number from eight to 17 this year because <laughs> uh, I remember when I was coaching, he came up to me. He said, my coach told me to model my game after you. And that, that was a very big compliment. And now seeing the success he's having and the importance he's have on that Rocket team right now is pretty neat. He, he He's a great defender like myself. He guards different positions like myself. He's a good three-point shooter like myself. But the only one thing he doesn't have like me, I was a pretty good athlete back in the day. I don't think he was as athletic athletic as I was. And I, that's another thing that I kind of forgot too, because I was watching some highlights and yeah, you were doing tip dunks and getting up yeah. on people and getting down the court. It kind of, you know, I think it's weird as, as time goes by, you remember like there's the, the famous shot against the Suns and you remember the shooting. And uh, for some reason, some of those highlights, I, maybe I'll, I'll, you know what, I'll have to do a video and, and remember, remind everybody uh, maybe about those Rockets teams and what you were doing, because it certainly was like, you know, it kind of feels like ground zero to what the modern game is now. 
Um, is it, although it's safe to say the modern game has a lot more player movement than what you guys were doing. It seems like there is a lot more, which might have even been what other teams were doing in your era, right? A lot of player movement, but just not spacing the three-point line. Is that is that fair to say for the other teams in that era? Well, to me, the difference is, the big difference is, is post play. You don't have a lot of good post players right now. So it's a pick and roll game. It's a movement game. The only time you see a uh, see a post up is when you switch. You see all the teams are switching. You got all the same side. Mm -hmm. Durant, you got a guard switch on Durant. What's Durant going to do? He's going to take him to the box. Same with Klay Thompson. You got a small guard on him. They're going to take him to the box. You don't have a guy sort of like you got a Cousins maybe or Anthony Davis where you can just come down the court and throw it down. But those guys are a dime a dozen. Back when I played, you had Shaq, you had Ewing, you had Alonzo, uh, you had Elijah Wan, you had David Robinson. You got guys you can throw it down there to, and they're going to cause a problem. There's a lot of guys you can go into a season this year, you go four or five guys in the league that you got to worry about in the post. So that's why the game is where it is. To me, we play like a European style of game right now. Pass and cut, movement. I love watching the Warriors play. They do it. Just outstanding, especially when you're watching Steph and Clay play. These guys don't never pass and stand. You got too many guys in the league who pass and stand. These guys pass and relocate to the three point line, which is great to watch. For sure, yeah. And we try and stress that the, the guys like the Steph, when he drives and, and will kick it, he will re get to that th corner three as Brent, quickly as he can. He wouldn't walk, he <laughs> would sprint to him and Clay would sprint to the three point line. And it's funny how they always end up with a three because they move with purpose. These got both those guys move with purpose. And there's another area of your life where you'd really benefit if you moved with purpose, and that's shaving your face with Harry's razors. I cannot tell you how much I love to open up their beautiful box to find the best ergonomically designed handle I've ever shaved with. Harry's founders got fed up with overpaying for expensive razors, so they bought their own blade factory and deliver some of the highest quality blades to your door, allowing you to pay as little as $2 a blade compared to as much as $4 for other brands. And right now, you can get their trial set for free by visiting harrys.com slash coach Nick. You'll get their weighted ergonomic handle, five blade razor with lubricating strip and trimmer blade, rich lathering shave gel, and a travel blade cover. Harry's has given me, without a doubt, the closest and best shave I've ever had. So you got to try it now by visiting harrys.com slash coach Nick. Make sure you type that in right, harrys.com slash coach Nick, and let them know I sent you to help support the show. You, you know, part of the thing that we do with defense, and it's interesting because when I do analysis during the games on Twitter and I'll share a little video clips about defense, it's usually where most people on Twitter will come and yell at me uh, as more, more vociferously than anything else. And it's strange because to me, the way I see defense, it seems really clear. Like you shouldn't be arguing. It's clear. It was his rotation. He should have been there. And I'm kind of curious on your end, when you were playing defense back in the day, like, no middle is a really big mantra for me when I coach. And then, you know, when I'm looking in what seems to be the best way to guard these guys and keep them out of the middle, was that a, a phrase? Was that a, a mindset when you guys were playing, you know, back in the NBA in, in the 90s? Two things were used. Not giving up middle and, 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 and weak side help. And I agree with you, Cole. Once you give up the middle, the defense collapse. Everybody sucks into the middle. And that's when you open, open up the shooters on the perimeter. I'm with you. I always – like forcing to the sideline. Uh, if a guy gets beat baseline, bottom guy got to rotate. Top yeah. <laughs> guy got to be ready to V back and rotate. So you don't see a lot of that no more. It's a lot of switching. I'm like, and and sometimes I watch the game, there's unnecessary switching. The picks are not even set and guys are switching. Fight over the screen. Keep fighting over the screen until the guy gets a legitimate switch. I watch the Warriors and Rockets. There's not even a pick set. It drives me crazy as a player and a coach and a defensive guy. When a guy don't even set a pick and these guys are switching, fight over it. If you don't want Steph Curry going at Clint Capella, fight over the screens. Then you get into the clock. They switch so easy now. It, it makes me sick instead of guys fighting over the screen. Yeah, I know. And I and I wish I could say something to make you feel better other than just accept it because it's it's where we're going. Where that is where we're yeah. going. It's a soft game. It's sort of like where football is going. 
The defensive player can't really do nothing. Yeah. Who's going to stop LeBron? If you can't put a forearm on LeBron who's 6'9", 250, how are you going to stop him? You got to allow just a little contact in the game. They, yeah. They're taking the freedom of movement a little bit overboard. Well, I think what's happened now with all the switching, now they want to slip all those screens to try and take advantage of that. Exactly. Right? And so you're right. The game is, is completely changed on that end. And I, I think about a year or two ago, I was kind of railing the same way. I'm like, look at this. It's not even close. And the guy, could, all he has to do is take one step over and yeah. he would have to switch. But um, it is easier. I just did a video on that. The one thing I do like about this, though, is aside from the switching, what we're seeing now is the, the pre-switching, where if they don't want Melo, for instance, to guard the ball screener, they'll get him off of that guy as he's going up the ball screen. I, and I kind of like that ballet. Or once the switch happens and the guy like is taking the smaller man down to the post, they'll bump him out of there. Like, like oh, that scram, whatever they call it now. I like that. That's interesting to me as far as the evolution of defense, which I don't think you probably weren't even allowed to do that back in the day, right? You probably would have gotten caught with a double teaming a guy without the ball, and that would have been a, obviously a, t, a t, I think, right? You couldn't do that back then. Yeah, and the rule, and you know, the rules changes also is a major factor. And you make a good point. All the good teams always bump out. The bad young teams, they'll stay in a bad mismatch. But if you see the veteran teams always communicating out there, the Spurs, the Warriors, the Rockets, they will bump a guy out. All the good defensive teams who know what the hell is going on out there, you make a great point. I love the bump out. You don't never want to leave a small guy on a big guy. When you got a chance to switch, it's a it's a two, three second time frame when you got the bump out. And all the good teams always gets that bump out guy out. Get a bigger guy on them and let the guard go out on the perimeter. For sure. And it's weird because, you know, there are young players that will come in and, you know, Draymond Green seemed to have that right away. I know he played at least three years in college. Four years in college. That's why. Yeah. Oh, that's why? Four years. Okay. So do you think that there's something to my theory? Like when I was looking at the Warriors when they first got good, look at their roster. Clay Thompson, three or three years in college. Uh, Steph Curry, I think four. Draymond Green, four. Um, There was more out there. Guys who played in college. Do you think that that was a, a coincidence? It's just huge. College, it it gets you prepared for the next level. That's why the league is so young right now. You get guys coming in after one year who are not ready. The game is a very difficult game. You got an 82-game season. You telling me a 20-year-old in mid-January, four games and five nights, his mind and body is going to be fresh? No, it's not. I've been on plenty of teams. I coach young teams where these guys hit the wall. And physically and mentally, they just break down. This is a tough league. NBA is a tough league. So you have to be mentally prepared for what's going on. And a lot of these young guys, and they write, it's a lot of guys hit the rookie wall, and you see it, left and right. And uh, training camp also bothers me. I mean, you can't. You only could have one non-contact practice. I mean, I remember us practicing twice a day for three hours for two weeks. <laughs> But we ne- we never got hurt. That was a thing back in the day. A lot of the older players never really got hurt. Now that they're doing less practice, you've seen a lot of guys get hurt left and right. You have to p- prepare for NBA season hard. There's no it's as a but. Professional sports, even in football, that's why a lot of guys are getting hurt in football because you're trying to cut back practice time. Practice is the most important time to prepare yourself for a season. Well, I know, but you can imagine how scared all these guys are in practice to, to have an injury there, right? I, I think that's obviously the motivation. So, but but it sounded like were your practices, you know, physical and 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 simulated games? Absolutely, absolutely. It no was one got hurt. Fights. I mean, it was almost <laughs> fights in practice. It was very intense. Guys wanted to get on the floor. I remember my Houston Rocket teams, myself and Sam Cassell, going against Vernon Maxwell and Kenny Smith. We're about to kill each other on the court. But once it's over, we're friends. We leave it on the court. That's what made our team so special. We would compete and try to kill each other in practice. But once it was over, we left it on the floor. We went out and ate together, drank together. And that's what creates a championship environment. And and you feel like that was, you know, we've seen ACL injuries a lot and all that kind of stuff. You feel like there's a connection to the the, the, how hard you guys practiced back then and, and the lack of injuries. Yeah, I just feel that, you know, you got to prepare these guys for a real hard season. And if you don't prepare them hard, things are going to happen. I mean, guys been getting hurt last couple years, left and right. And I'm thinking this, you're not preparing right for NBA season. So I'm hoping it don't happen this year because I like to see everybody on the floor. 
And you know when it comes playoff time, I mean, the one year Kawhi was hurt, you you always have key, you know, cousins hurt. You got key players going in the playoffs who are hurt who you want to see. For sure. Do we have a minute to, to, to compare and contrast some of the coaches you played for? Absolutely. All right. So you played for Greg Popovich. You played for Rudy Tomjanovich. Um, who, what, what was that? What was the comparison of them uh, the, between now? Because Popovich, by the way, gets a, a nice rap now about, you know, positive coaching and really building players up. Something tells me that back in the day, he was a pretty tough guy who would get on you. Well, the thing was, it didn't bother me. That, that, that was sort of the environment back in the day. But Pop knew what buttons to push. I mean, he knew who to attack. The great thing about Pop was he would get on Dave and Tim, who were our leaders, and they would allow themselves to be coached. And it trickled down to the rest of the squad. When two of the greatest players to ever play the game, and David Robinson and Tim Duncan, allowed themselves to be coached, it trickles down to the rest of the squad, and that's what happened. So we followed his lead. He he knew what buttons, buttons to push, and we followed it. And that's why, to me, he's one of the greatest coaches ever. And then Rudy T was a great player's coach. He sort of had a different style than Pop. We had sort of some tough personalities really had to deal with in use of myself, Vernon, Sam, Otis. So we were a little rough group, but Rudy knew how to handle us. He knew he let us be ourselves. You know, we would get into altercations, but Rudy understood that's who this guy is. So that's why I work for him also. Vernon Maxwell, uh, was he really as crazy as it seemed? He was, but he's the best <laughs> teammate I ever had. One of the best competitors I ever played with. Um, my year playing with him, never seen a guy hit so many game winning or tying shots. Just the ultimate competitor. I love Vernon Maxwell, one of my best friends. Crazy, yeah, but his basketball skill speaks for itself. Competing against Michael Jordan, scoring 50 in a game, down two zip against the Suns, going down there, scoring 35 in the second half. That's what you love about Vernon Maxwell. He was a riverboat gambler. He'll go 0 for 15 but wasn't scared to hit the next, shoot the next shot. That's what made Vernon Maxwell a great player. Yeah, it, it was mean. Like, those are the kind of guys, it reminds me of a little bit of, uh, you know, Brandon Roy or something like that, who, when you, you kind of got into his stance and you wanted to guard him, he, he, he was going to run right over you, like, to, to get that bucket. Who would he be like now? Because I don't know if people remember Vernon Maxwell that much, but who would you describe him like? Who can you compare him to? I, his mentality is like a Patrick Beverly, not the skill. Oh. Patrick Beverly's nowhere near as good as Vernon Maxwell was. But the competitive side and the way he approaches the game with the toughness and mentality, I would have to say Patrick Beverly. Because Patrick Beverly get up in your face. He don't mind talking mess. He doesn't back down from anybody. That's how Vernon Maxwell was. He don't care if it's Michael Jordan, Grand Hill, whoever he was playing against. He was a competitor. And I bet those of you who are listening are also competitors who want to look and feel as good as possible. If you're anything like me, you might look at a picture of yourself from eight years ago and say, damn, did I look young? What happened? I've got wrinkles, my skin looks dry, and I'm slowly realizing soap and water isn't going to cut it for my face. A great way to fight the aging process is to visit 4 a one-stop shop for skin care, hair loss, and sexual wellness for men. Hims Anti-Aging Kit is a custom prescription cream tailored to your skin that will reduce the appearance of wrinkles and fine lines. And guess what? It's not a secret. It's called Tretinoin, and it keeps your skin firm and looking young. Best of all, you don't have to pay a fancy dermatologist to get it. Hims connects you with doctors online who will evaluate your skin needs and prescribe you a custom anti-aging treatment. Just take a couple of pictures and answer a few questions. It's your skin. Do you want to be a face in the crowd or the face in the crowd? Order now and save $20 off your first month of the Hims Anti-Aging Kit. Lock in those looks now and get your first month of anti-aging for $20 off. Go to 4 slash Coach SC. That's 4 slash C-O-A-C-H. SC. Now, uh, Don Nelson, uh, a sentence or two about him. What was that? How interesting was that? 
the best offensive mind I ever seen in a coach. Uh, created the small lineup. Uh, I was part of that run TMC team uh, in in the early '90s where we were scoring 116 points a game. He originated the free throw ISO that Dirk does that everybody's trying to do. That was Don Nelson. You know, he he was he was an offensive genius. I mean, so, he understood matchups. He understood the rules. And um, I remember us playing San Antonio my first year in the league with the Warriors. We're the seventh seed. They were the second seed. They had David Robinson, great player. But back then, the rules, if you had your player above the free throw line, that they had to be above the free throw line. <laughs> so myself and Tom Tober would just stand above the free throw line. And Chris Mullen, Mitch Richmond, and Tim Hardaway would be playing 3 on 3 on one side of the floor. And Don Nelson created that. He created that situation, and we end up beating them, a seventh seed beating a second seed, and we end up losing to the Lakers in the second round. Uh, you know, I have a memory of them changing the rule to not allow that, and it's a, like a weird – Yeah, after thing. that year, they changed the rule. And somebody got them, like, there's no like, rule like that, no and they – Right, yeah, and they proved it to me because, and I guess it was out of that, right? Where because it became a real unbalanced floor when you did that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. David Robinson is like one of the best shot blockers in the league. He's at the foul line. Should I go? We got maybe three or four illegal defenses on him because he's used to gravitating towards the ball in the paint. But we had him lifted. But credit to Don Nelson for that game plan. All right, well let's let's wrap this up by talking about the kiss of death because it's I think it's your famous the the most famous shot you had in the corner against the Suns. Now I watched some of the um, the replays on this, and they cut out the, the or there isn't a uh, a score or a clock on the bottom, so I can't remember. I'm looking for it right now, but you can tell me. Do you remember the situation was what was the score? Were you guys down it like was, it was one ten one ten? Oh, so it was a tie game. It was a tie game because Kevin Johnson had two free throws. He was twenty one for twenty one. It would have put the Suns up one, but he made one out of two. Okay, he called the timeout. Clyde took the ball out. Kenny went to get the ball. Robert was at half court. I was on the far corner, and Dream was under the basket. I want to thank a good friend of mine, Danny Ains, for double teaming off me in the back court. That's what allowed Kenny to hit Robert on the short pass at half court. Danny Ains is way in the back court with Kenny. He's supposed to be guarding me. Robert <laughs> spots me in the corner, throws a, a pass to me in the corner. So it's me in the corner, Elijah Wan and Danny Shade. Danny Shays is not leaving number 34 for mm -hmm. no reason. So once he saw me cock my slow set shot, Danny, Ains, Danny <laughs> Shays is like, I got to get out and contest this. But it was too late. As a shooter, you know when a shot feels good, that shot felt good. Every part of that shot felt good. Footwork, the release, and then when you see it go all net, and then the first guy I look at is Joe Klein, and you know what I did? I blew him the kiss of death. And the rest is history. Well, let's put your coaching hat on for one second because it's a tie game. There, was there a timeout out of that or was that off the, off the rebound of the missed free throw? It was a tie. After Kevin Johnson went one for two, we called a timeout. Okay. So we let did. me ask you this. It's a tie game. They're inbound. You, know, where, you were inbound again in the backcourt, right? Yes. Why on earth are they pressing? Exactly. That's why I understand. And if you remember the Phoenix-Chicago series, why was Danny Ains helping out on Horace Grant? and leaving John John, John Paxson open for the three. Yeah. And that cost them. So I don't know if Danny Ains, you know, you cost your team two big plays, one by Paxson, one by me. Just stay solid. Right. Just stay solid. Why you go double team with a tie game in a game seven at your own four? I didn't understand that. Right. I guess they wanted to leave me open, and they got burned for it. Is that Paul Westfall? Yes, it is. Yeah, because, like, Who's to a me – a good friend of mine – who I coached with in Sacramento. I love Paul Westfall. So I don't know if he said it or did Danny Ainge just go on and win. Oh, I'm guarding Mary right. Ellie. We can leave him open. Well, so. even independent of Danny Ainge doing that, which he shouldn't have, the, the whole team was stretched out in the backcourt where it was like that, the last thing you want to do is get out of position like that, you know, to, to give that an opening. But well, let's give credit where it's due. A, the shot, you hit the shot. That, you know, you hit it. But B, you know, that the look by Ori on a cross-court pass accurately you know that you know that's that's a that's the probably the pass they would have wanted you to have to make but absolutely again and the thing is if shades would have closed out on me yeah elijah open under the basket that's the thing i was thinking about 
I said, Shades didn't close out on me. So if I miss, Dream has inside position. He may get an offensive rebound. But at the moment, I was really focusing on making the shot and putting Danny Danny Shades in a tough position. Because I don't blame him. I wouldn't leave 34 either. <laughs> right. So he's... He saw me starting to shoot, then it was too late then. For sure, for sure. Well, Mario, I can't thank you enough for coming on and giving us some glimpses into the 90s basketball and how it's it's changed or maybe not even changed as much as we thought. Yes, it changed. I missed the 90s. All my buddies said they missed the 90s basketball, especially the competition, man. You know, you don't want – I'm tired of these super teams. Kevin Durant, you're the second best player in the league. You don't need to join a 73-win team. You're a good player. Let's keep the balance in the NBA – that's why you go there is for the competition. That's do you think that the rivalries we had back then, and they were real rivalry, rivalries that lasted a long time, do you think it was rooted in the physicality of the game, the fact that it was it was just physical and not violent, but certainly that, whereas maybe we don't have that now because there's a lack of the physical? Well, I just remember our 93 championship finals against the Knicks. That changed a lot of rules because that was just a drag down, knock down fight basically a fight for seven games and uh and after that game after that series the nba is like we got to change the rule with the <laughs> head check it so that's when you sort of sort of things started to change in the early 90s and now we got just and one mixtape basketball now you can't touch nobody just come down fire threes or or, or dunks i mean you telling me you taking away the mid-range game that's that's ridiculous, man. That's ridiculous. Thank God for Chris Paul, who's a great mid-range shooter. Keep shooting him. All right. Well, you know, we have to go. Let's do this again because I, I want to at some point talk about Power Memorial. I want to talk about playing with Chris Mullen uh, in high school. That would be great. You know, there's a lot of interesting stories there that I was uncovering. So promise me you'll come back and we'll do another one. Absolutely, my brother. It was great chatting with you. Love talking shop, too. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you. And uh, and don't forget, sports fans, at B-Ball Breakdown, we're not a channel. We're a conversation. You in? Are you in, Mario? I'm in, brother.